Okay, well, thank you very much for coming. Hope you enjoyed Grant's talk. Um, I'm David Atkinson. I am a product manager here at Redgate, and I'm going to talk about automated build and test. So that's continuous integration, and that is specifically for your database. So I'm not covering how you do it for your application code. Uh, I'm taking that as a given, or if it's not a given, then there are plenty of resources around to learn how to do that. So what will we cover today? So database build automation. What is that? How, how, do, how do we do it? You know, why, why should we do it? Um, most of this is not going to be slides. I'm going to show you how it's set up on, on my demo machine, and I'm going to give you an idea of how to get this running uh, in your own environments. And, of course, um, I've done this a number of times, and I, and I take things for granted, so please stick your hand up and ask questions as we go along, especially if I, if I rush through something that isn't obvious. So, uh, first of all, a show of hands. I've got sort of like four separate um, categories here. Um, I'd just li like to get an idea of uh, sort of how mature your practices are. So, um, uh, number one is database objects and scripts aren't in ver version control. Two is they are in version control. Three is you've got some sort of automated build system um, and building and testing the database. So, I'm not talking about your application code here. And um, number four is um, you've got some automated release system and you're using that to, to promote your changes um, through your environment. So that can be dev, test, staging, um, UAT, production. So who's in category one? Who's not source controlling their database code at all? This is fantastic. So there was, there was actually no point in going to Grant's talk, was there? <laughs> okay, so I'll, I'll, hopefully, I'll make this one worthwhile. So um, number two. Your objects are in source control, but you're not doing anything in three and four. Okay, that's two thirds of you, I reckon, or possibly more. And uh, who's using an automated build system to do something with their database? That's two people. And anyone doing automated releases for their database? Zero. That's perfect. So we've got lots of people in category two, or almost everybody, and some in three, because this talk is going to focus on how to get from two to three. So this was a, a good gamble. And what I can tell you is that um, compared to uh, the, the guys in the US, which is uh, the last place we did this, you guys are a lot more mature, so that's, that's very promising. So what is continuous integration? This definition comes from Jez Humble, who wrote a book called Continuous Delivery. Who's read the, this book or heard of this book? One person. It's a very good book, two people. I recommend you get it. It's, uh, it's, it doesn't focus on any particular technology. It talks about the concepts behind uh, versioning, uh, continuous integration, releasing, best practices. Um, it's, a great, it's a great read. He, he has a blog as well, it's, it's worth looking at. He defines continuous integration as a practice designed to ensure that your software is always working and that you get comprehensive feedback in a few minutes as to whether any given change to your system has broken it. It's all about testing but continuously. The question is, what is database continuous integration? And it's very hard to find any information about this. You have code in your database, it should be Straightforward. And I'm going to suggest that database continuous integration is a practice designed to ensure that your database is working and that you get feedback in a few minutes as to whether any change has broken it. So you shouldn't be treating your database code differently. It's still code. If you believe that it's the right thing to do to have best practices for your application code, there's absolutely no reason that you shouldn't be doing this for your database code. This is um, a diagram that shows you more or less how continuous integration works. Um, <coughs> from the database perspective. So we have a bunch of developers here. I can get the mouse pointer on there. So we have a bunch of developers using uh, their own individual databases where possible. Uh, you, you might prefer to have a shared database in, in your environment. That's fine too. Um, when changes are made, they go into source control. Uh, once they're in source control, the build systems are often configured to detect that something has been added to source control and will trigger a build. And we'll go into what that build does later. And as part of that process, you're often doing some testing as well. And, and then any feedback goes back to the development team and it's a cycle that carries on. So what is build? For application code, it's, it's very easy. You're compiling code. For database code, you're not really compiling it. Um, you can build a database. So it can be the database creation script. You can say, okay, building my database is turning whatever I have in version control into something to build a new database from scratch. And that's perfectly valid, especially if you're just starting out and you're building a uh, new database for your customers. But what if 
you've got existing databases at a particular version. And this is the more common case. You're going from version 3 to version 4, for example, um, and you can't just wipe the old one out like you can with application code and put in a new one. You have to then upgrade the existing state to the new state, preserving all the data. What is test? For .NET, um, you, you have tools such as NUnit. Who uses NUnit here? Uh, one, who uses something that's not NUnit that does unit testing? Uh, can I ask what that is? Just roughly MS test? MS -test? It's just okay, that's probably MS test as well. Anything, anything else? No? Okay, excellent. So these tests can often be run as part of your continuous integration, your, your build process, and they can be run on your own local machine just to make sure that things are working before you commit it to, um, to a version control. Um, what about the database? So um, we, we've looked for, to see what there is in the SQL Server world, and T-SQL T is the only framework, testing framework, that looks like it's um, being maintained and is actually a very, very good uh, unit testing framework. Who here has heard of T-SQL T? Excellent, that's uh, at least 33%. Um, who uses T-SQL T? That's fewer, so not so good. So T-SQL T is open source, therefore it's free. So you don't really have an excuse not, not to, to, to at least consider it. Um, it's written in <coughs> SQL, for SQL Server, tests implemented in SQL, and I'll, I'll, I'll cover that in the demo later. And, it, and we, have, we have a tool at Redgate called SQL Test, which is a, a, a GUI wrapper for Management Studio. So you can, um, you can run, uh, run tests via a nice little user interface. Um, whereas you can use T-SQL T on its own by running um, various um, store procedures that are, that are built into the framework. So um, the rest of the session is pretty much running through a demo. So uh, this is my scenario. We have two fictional d developers, uh, David, that's me, and, and Grant, uh, working as part of a team on the simpletor.com website. Um, and this application is an ASP.NET web application with a SQL Server backend. So we've already set up continuous integration. Um, and what this is doing is, is keeping a test database up to date every time a change is made. This is just useful so that uh, testers or uh, pe people who want to know what's latest and greatest can go to this um, application and know that they've got all the changes there. It's also running T SQL T unit tests. Um, on realistic amounts of data, and that's, that's key because we, we can generate data um, for the continuous integration environment. We're generating documentation. This is uh, using uh, the SQL doc tool, um, and this allows all the developers to, to use that as a reference. And we're also generating deployment scripts uh, on the go as well, and that also tests the, the deployment scripts. Um, so the scenario is that a few improvements are being made to Simple Talk. Um, these changes will be deployed to production at some point, but uh, we need confidence that these changes uh, work. So we need to test these changes and we need to be confident that we're not deploying something that will break. Um, these are the tools that we'll be using as part of the demo. So I'm, I've set up Team City, but it really doesn't matter what you use. So if you're using um, um, Visual Studio, uh, Team Build, if you're using um, Bamboo, um, Cruise control. There are many different build systems, and it doesn't matter which one you use because we have resources that would allow you to uh, get this up and running. But we we have a Team City uh, plugin which is which makes it quite usable. Um, so team, the SQL automation pack is is the um, the container uh, of resources to get you up and running uh, with this sort of um, process. Glimpse. Uh, I'll, I'll show you uh, an open source tool that uh, is, is quite funky. That that is, again, it's open source and it's free, and it's something that Redgate supports. And from the developer bundle, we've got the SQL source control that you've seen, SQL test that uh, I've mentioned, data generator, and doc. So let's get the demo going. So first of all, I'll, I want to show you the, the application. So I've got Visual Studio on my machine. Here you can see I've got a solution with Simple Talk, um, And I'm just going to start the application so you can see what it looks like. This is my local dev copy of Simple Talk. 
Um, and you can see it's just uh, it's a bunch of articles, uh, custom OSS feeds here, uh, fairly st standard uh, web application. Um, Management Studio, um, I have a bunch of databases. Um, in particular, I've got um, these two green databases here. They're linked to source control. Uh, one's called Simple Talk Dev. That's my database. And Simple Talk Dev underscore Grant is Grant's database. Um, the change that has been made recently, that the one we're slightly concerned about because we haven't it hasn't been tested properly, is um, is adds this to the website. So we've got something uh, just after the, num the comments here, which is about three minutes to read. This is just a sort of useful indicator of how long an article is and how long um, it might take you to read. So if you have a few minutes spare, for example, in a break, then you can choose the right article. So that, that's, that's the feature that's been put in there. But this, this has not been made live yet. So this is the one that we need to test. Um, so just to show you that this is fully functional, this environment, I'll just show you, just make a few changes. Um, and all my changes are saved in SQL prompt snippets, just to make it very easy uh, to not make mistakes whilst typing. So th this one here is just going to make some changes to SQL Simple Talk Dev. Uh, they're just a bunch of changes like creating new procedures, altering existing procedures. Um, and it even adds an RSS feed here that I will personalize for the audience. So I'm going to type Cambridge there. I'm going to press F5, and this should make changes to my database. Um, and I can see these changes if I refresh SQL Source Control. And there you go. We've got a bunch of changes listed. And I'm going to now um, sorry, commit them. Some changes. Obviously, you'll type a more sensible comment there. Um, and I'm going to commit these. And what I can do is I can go to Grant. Oh, f firstly, let me just show you uh, my, my local dev environment. If I refresh this, um, I can now see on, on the right-hand side, I have um, Cambridge added to the list. So this proves that this is all linked together and not just smoke and mirrors. Not that you would think that it would be smoke and mirrors. Um, so as Grant, to get the changes, I'll go to get latest. I can see the changes here, and I click get latest, and, and it pulls all the changes into my environment. So you've seen this before. It's very straightforward to collaborate uh, on changes. And uh, the, the only uh, additional thing that we, we're doing here is because I have a build system installed and running, it's kicked off a build. So this, this ind uh, progress indicator here is telling me that it's doing something. It's got two minutes left to run. and uh, um, I'll probably I'll spend a bit of time showing you exactly what's happening. So um, a build is, <coughs> there are three main ingredients to a build. So you need um, a VCS route, so that's version control settings route. It's where in, what in your repository you want to pull from. So you need to specify that. That'll be somewhere in TFS, in subversion, in Git, uh, whichever um, source control system you use. Then you need something, a trigger. So you need a rule that tells you when to start the process. Um, and that can be, um, it can be a scheduled thing, so you might want to only do it at 3 a.m. because you know it's quite a resource-intensive process. Mm -hmm. Or, if you're doing proper continuous integration, you'll be doing every time a change is detected. So this is set up to do every time a change is detected, hence <coughs> the build having started. And the, uh, the last thing uh, is the what it actually does. So that's the, the build steps. So. Here we have version control settings, and this is pointing to a subversion, um, a subversion repository on my local machine. Uh, my build trigger tells me trigger a build after a check-in is detected, and my build step runs the Redgate SQL Server build step. So this is what we provide to make database continuous integration easy for you to implement. You don't have to write code or use our command lines or, our, or the SDK. You can just use our uh, TeamCity plugin, or if you've got another uh, version another build server, you can use our NAND scripts or our MS build scripts. And all of these systems support those formats. What this does here uh, is a bunch of um, continuous integration tasks. 
So one ta such task is update a database on every build. So this database called update, up, always update up to date with data, a source control is a database on my server that stays up to date. So every time I make a change, that change gets pushed to that environment. Next, I am um, running T-SQL t-tests on the database. So um, this tells it to also generate some data before running the test, just to make it slightly more realistic as an environment. Um, then we have documentation. So create documentation of the database. So that generates a nice document report. Generate database creation scripts and ge generate database upgrade scripts. So it just builds these every build. And if I, if I uh, checked on those validate scripts, it would also <coughs> run through the process of testing them. So testing an upgrade script is creating it, but also running it on a database that we create purely for the purposes of testing it. So we run it on that database and check the up upgrade works as expected. And lastly, um, we've got Deployment Manager configured here. This is the tool that I'm guessing that you're not that familiar with. Who's heard of Deployment Manager? Oh, that's uh, more than I thought. Did Grant mention it in his talk? No? Okay. That's, uh, so no cheating has happened. Um, well done. Our marketing is working. Um, the point is, to create a database package in Deployment Manager. This creates an artifact that is published to Deployment Manager. Um, that means that it can, it can, um, it can deploy those uh, using the Deployment Manager tool. I won't cover that in this session because Grant will be covering that uh, in the next one. So by now, I'm hoping that the, the builds will have finished. And you can see it has finished. It's passed the tests. Fantastic. Um, if I click on this drop down, I can view the tests as well. Um, so here are the tests that are configured in my system, which I'll show you in a moment. I can show you the documentation. So this is, um, if, you have, if you've used SQL doc before, you'll, you'll understand how this works. It just shows you metadata for your database. It's basically your schema in a nice um, web page. And it's got some, um, it's got the, uh, the, the upgrade scripts, and these are put inside the, um, the database package. So this might be quite hard to see from the back. But you can see, for example, I've got a creation script, which is loading. And if I open it, and um, you can, if you could see this, it's not very interesting. It's just loads of create statements because it's a creation script. And, and if I scroll down to the bottom, you can see it's also some insert statements because I have static data in source control as well. So this builds my database from scratch. <coughs> OK, so that's a brief introdu introduction of um, how it's set up, and I'm running out of time, so I'll go back to to Management Studio and start um, you know, solving the problem I've been asked to solve, which is to give us confidence that the change that's been made, which is the estimated read time, um, hasn't broken anything so that we can deploy it. So what I'm going to do is show you SQL test, because I'm going to add a test. Um, this is a little UI that um, runs on top of the T-SQL T framework. And there are some tests that are already configured. And I can, I can run a test by just selecting the top level or a specific test and clicking run. And it will run through my tests. And hopefully, um, it should put little ticks next to them, as we can see that. I can add a new test by right-clicking here and say new test. Give it a name. So I'm going to say page load time. Because so, what I'm going to do is I'm going to write a test that is going to time the Simple talk home page and make sure that it's still responsive given the fact that we've just added something to it. Quick test. And this adds the test. Tests are implemented as stored procedures and they're saved in your database. So although they're in your dev databases, what you would do is you would avoid deploying them to production because it's a it's a sort of a it's like a, a debug build uh, in Visual Studio. You wouldn't deploy that build, you'd, you'd deploy the release one. Um, that's a question. They, they are placed in a, yes, that, the system does it for you. So if I show you um, what it looks like under the hood, so you can see store procedures, and um, do I have any tests here? I must have tests there because they're listed. So, so you can see you, we've got um, a couple of, the, my two unit tests here, 
are in the unit test schema. So the schema that gets created is the test class that you saw in the previous screen. So these, these guys here are <coughs> separate schemas. But you don't need to think about that because there are helper methods that do that in the T-SQL T framework. And of course, if you do it using the SQL test UI, then it obviously does all that for you. But, so it's, it's built a shell test, but it hasn't put any content in. And the test fails by default just so that you don't get any false positives and you think you've, you've, you've actually written it. So if I run this test now, it fails because it's just a test that says fail. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to implement the test by deleting all the comments, and I shall cheat and use one I built earlier. But, but all this does is it times, um, let's bring this up on the screen big, it, it times the ca calling of dbo.v underscore articles, which is the, the, um, the procedure that gets, um, sorry, the view that gets called to, to show the articles in the main page. And it times that, and if the time is above 200 milliseconds, it will fail. So press F5 to, to um, apply the change. And I can now um, run, run it again. Whoops, that should have happened. Um, if SQL Server sleeps a bit and it wakes up, then, um, then, it, then it, things always take slightly longer. So um, what you can see is that it's got an acceptability threshold of 200, and it's, and it's below that. I can also test this manually. So you would, you would run the test and you'd have confidence that it works. But of course, the, the real test is just by going to your local environment here and saying, well, I can see the change here. I can press F5 a few times. And it seems fairly responsive. Um, wh what you might have noticed is this thing at the bottom of the screen. Who recognizes this thing at the bottom of the screen? Um, you, you might not all be able to see that. It's this guy here. Does anyone recognize that? This is called Glimpse. It's an open source tool that, that glimpses into your um, web um, site. So I can see I've got some DB queries here, and it tells me how long they took. And I can drill down further even, and I can see the queries that will actually run on this page. So you can see here, select star from the articles, order by published date. That's what's running to, uh, to show the articles. And also the select feed name from RSS feeds, which is what's displaying the RSS feeds on the top right-hand corner. So this is a really useful application, entirely free, open source, um, also worth looking at. So this gives me confidence that it's, qu it's quick enough to run on my dev environment and the test has uh, passed, therefore why, why not commit this to source control? Because um, everything's fine, right? Okay, let's commit changes. Um, so I'm going to write confirmed that all is fine. Um, the new change is good to go, exclamation mark, commit. So that obviously goes into source control. Um, Grant could then go and um, go to get latest, take the change, which is the unit test. And the cool thing here is that because these tests are implemented um, in source control as stored procedures, and they get pulled up with, it, with other normal changes, Grant, in, in his version of um, SQL test, if he refreshes it, will see the same test. And it means that any changes he makes that might impact the, the load time of the page um, will get caught in his environment before he commits changes. So it's like a regression test now. So he can run this on his environment as well. Uh, there was a question, I think, from over here. Was there a... No? OK. Um, so. Um, as just, just because we committed that test, that will have um, initiated a, a new build, which will go through the same procedure as before, which is generating test data, running the unit tests, um, running through the, um, the documentation, generating the upgrade scripts, um, and it generates upgrade scripts for each environment that's deployed. So what it does is it queries deployment manager, if you have that installed, if you're using that option, and asks deployment manager which uh, environments are out there in the world. And based on those versions that it receives, it will generate multiple upgrade scripts. Um, so you, you have confidence that all your environments have had upgrade tests and upgrade scripts generated for them. And of course, it does a creation script as well. OK, well, clearly something's gone wrong here, because I've, I've got SQL CI failed with error message running unit test fails. So that, that doesn't look very good. 
So let's drill down and see what it says. Um, so it says there's a test that's failed, and the test that's failed is the load time test. And that's strange, because we ran it before we committed it. Um, the error message that comes up, it says um, it, it's, it's got recorded 2,000 milliseconds, which is two seconds, which is obviously above a 200 milliseconds, so, so it's failed. But it also says it's got 10,000 articles. So as part of our CI build, we've, we've opted to add 10,000 articles because we know that that's a realistic amount, or at least um, a required amount for the Simple Talk website. Um, on my local environment, I don't have as many. And I'm, if I um, quickly show you what I've got um, by, um, let's just grab a spare query window. Select star from articles, five, I have five. So on my site, I have five. On the CI server, I have 10,000. So clearly, performance-wise, it's not going if there is a relationship between the number of articles uh, and the response time on the page, it, I'm not going to pick it up on mine. But I've picked it up on CI. So that, that's, that's a, a useful feature. So what do I want to do now? I need to try to reproduce this, this problem on my environment so that I can, I can try to resolve it. So what I will do is I will, I will take the, I will generate this, the same data on my local environment and see if, if I can reproduce the issue. So find my working folder and the lots of data.sqlgen is the one that's configured in in my build step, and I'll just quickly show you where that's done. It's just under the tests here. So as you can see, we've got lots of data.sqlgen, and that's the, um, the, the file data generator um, uses to, to, to know how many <coughs> records to generate and uh, on which tables. So if I double click on that, we will launch the data generator tool. Has anyone here tried data generator before? This couple, okay. Well, I won't go into too much detail because I don't think we have time, but uh, you've got a bunch of tables on the left-hand side. Here you can see articles is selected, and here you've got a number of records you want generated, which are 10,000, and below you've got a preview of what the data looks like. So if I click Generate Data, this will now run 10,000 um, additional rows on, uh, and apply those to my, to my development environment. It's nearly done. Okay, so if I run this again, and I show you that number in the bottom right, you can see it's got 10,005 rows, uh, which is 10,000 more than I had before. So let's quickly look to see what the response time is um, if I run my test, which is down here. Okay, this has failed. And you can see that it's failed because it's taken nearly two seconds. And that's clearly above 200 milliseconds. So I've managed to reproduce it by running it locally. That's fantastic. Um, let's see what my web page looks like, my local dev copy, if I press F5. Okay, that's not, that's not good. So it's completely failed to load. But that, that's strange. I just expected it to be slow. I didn't expect it to fail. So. What, what is the issue? It's doing some sort of convert to, to date time up there, and it's, it's telling me object cannot be cast from DB null to other types. So what's happening here is that the, in the data I've generated, um, let's scroll down a bit, you'll see that I have nulls under the publish date. And my code is trying to um, convert those and it's failing to convert those because null is not a valid input into that method. So it's failing. And you could argue that published date should never be null, so I should never have that in my data. But if that's the case, why does my data type allow null values? It should really be not null. So while I'm here, <coughs> I, I, I might as well fix that issue. So I've got, a, I've got a, another snippet, and I'm going to, first of all, fix all my data. 
so that it fixes the website. So I can do that. And I'm also going to alter my column so that this could never happen again. Because data generator is just putting all the values it can possibly think of into that data type. So nulls, nulls as well. You can configure it not to do that, but uh, you know, it's good because we've, we found that this deficiency, we found this deficiency because of that. So I'm going to make that change. And if I go back to my page now and press F5, hopefully it works. It works, but if we look at Glimpse now, it's taken, it's taken over two seconds to, um, to do my database query. So two seconds for, for um, refreshing a web page isn't good these days. So it's something I definitely want to fix. Um, so how do we identify what's going on there? So let's go back to the test. So the, the test here, if I double click on it, it will load up into a query window. And of course, we, what we were doing is we were just selecting from V underscore articles. What I can do is I can right click and go to script as alter, which is a SQL prompt feature. Let's close this down here. This is my view. And this here is, is the, uh, the new code the function that we're calling that is calculating the estimated reading time. So this is the new change. So I suspect that it's, it's something related to this. So I'm going to drill down further um, into this function, which should load at some point. There we go. And we can see some sort of algorithm that someone's written to calculate the estimated reading time. Um, I'm not going to go into too much detail, but this, this, the way it works is it sort of tries to work how many words there are by spotting the spaces between the words, and then, and then it uses some sort of um, estimate that uh, you, you can only um, read 250 words per minute or something, and, and it, th that doesn't really matter. Uh, what's interesting here is that um, there's some more code that's been commented out here with a message saying, um, below is Grant's simple function that I improved with the one above. So, so somebody called Timmy has put a comment in there has replaced some code with his own code. So what I'm going to suggest we do here is take the simpler, simple version and reapply it to see if that um, helps. And <coughs> if we run this test again, it passes. It's now really quick again. So, so the new algorithm that somewhat a developer changed caused the problem. And we can see that the response time is really quick now. It's 36 milliseconds, um, which is even better than it, than it was with my small amount of data. If I, if I now go back to, uh, to my web page here and press F5, I also can see that this has radically improved the database query time over here. So that's now fantastic. And you could, all, you could see that just by seeing how quickly the page refreshes. It's now lightning fast. Fantastic. So mission accomplished. Let, let us go back and commit that change. So what? What should we type in the comments? So we've um, we sort of reverted Timmy's change, um, and of course, what we've also done is set the not null to the publish date. Uh, also, uh, also, publish date is not null. Uh, it's also articles. Okay, commit. So there you go, and so this is going to kick off yet another build. Um, if I can show you that again here. And it's kicked off another build, and this will hopefully demonstrate that the tests pass now and everything's great, and it'll be a pass build. Um, and what Grant can do, of course, is that he, he needs to, you know, may possibly every morning take the latest changes, and he wants to take the latest fix, so he could click get latest and take those changes. So. I'm just about to click Get Latest. Can anyone guess what problems might occur when I click Get Latest now? Delete it. Sorry? Delete the data, drop the table, and Oh, that, yeah. Uh, which data? In? The database that you Okay, and, and what, why is it doing that? Because it's going to drop the table, and Okay, so, we've, is that, so they're not null. So what's happened here is that We've, we've changed a column from um, null to not null. 
So it's not actually going to delete the data. What's going to, it's, it's going to try to do is it's, it's going to try to alter that column. And it can only succeed if there are no um, null values in Grant's data. So if I have null values in Grant's data and I try to run something that says alter column uh, to, to be not null, then it will just fail. Because what we did, of course, on, on, on my database is I ran an update statement first and I set it to an arbitrary value. I set it to the 1st of January 2000. But, but you know, how does, how does SQL Source Control on Get Latest know to set that arbitrary value? I haven't told it to. So let's go ahead and do it anyway, just so you can see how it's failed. It hasn't failed yet, but it warns me. So it says, <coughs> there is no default, default value for my column, because I've just said, I want this to be not null. It's been marked, the column's been marked as not null, and, there's, and then updates may fail. And I, and I can choose to ignore this and just say, just, yeah, do it anyway, I'm fine. And it fails, because it, it actually tries to run the scripts, and SQL Server says, no, this, this is impossible. You have null data. So this is no good. So what, what are the possible solutions? What we could do is we could ask Grant to... Oh, just can you write an up, run that update on your database as well, and then before you do the get latest? And that would work, that's fine. But what if there are 50 grants? If your team is huge, you'd have to send an email out to your whole team and say, look, can you run this update statement? Sorry, I've just made a change that's going to cause you problems doing a get latest. And even if you did that, um, what about the upgrade process? So once you try to create an upgrade script to m move your production database to the next version, how about that? What if there are nulls in your production? You, you, you would then have to manually edit that script, which is, which is really not good. What you really want to do is tell the system, do that update before you change that value. And, uh, and we have a mechanism to do this, uh, in a, which is a, a fairly new mechanism. It's, it's, we're calling it Migrations V2, but the name is irrelevant. And I'll, I'll uh, just head over to some slides to show you how that works. Um, okay, so here we go. So, introduction to migrations. So when we generate a deployment script, there are some changes are made, so they can be procedures are changed, views are dropped, tables are created, whatever. There are loads of different changes you can make, and they're made um, in a particular order. But SQL Compare, when it um, tries to work out how to get you from A to B, or from version 1 to version 12, it has to infer the changes by looking at the the, the target database and the source database. Um, and there are a bunch of changes that can't easily be inferred. So if you've done a, um, let's say, a table merge or a table split or um, you've renamed a column, if you rename a table or a column and you just see the before and after state, that two things could have happened. Either you've renamed it or you've actually dropped one and recreated another one. So this tool just does not know which one to choose. And SQL Compare actually chooses the evil one. It will choose to lose your data. It will choose to drop your table. It'll warn you, but you'll drop your table and put it back there, but minus the data. And that's not, that's not great. And any sort of um, change that requires data motion, like a table split where you split it into two places, but you have to then tell it how to split a column, uh, what's the logic to do that, those sorts of changes um, aren't supported by SQL Compare. Not because SQL Compare is deficient, it's just it's impossible because it just doesn't know. So what we have is a sort of mechanism to uh, allow you to create your own custom migration script and sort of insert it into the, into the logic, into the process. So if you want to get from version 1 to version 12, what, what we would do is we would run these migration scripts um, in advance on a, on a database that we create under the hood so you get, for example, you go from version 1 to 1 prime. And 1 prime never really exists in reality. Uh, but that 1 prime is then compared to your target database. SQL Compare does the rest, at attaches its script to your migration scripts, which produces the overall um, deployment script. So let me show you how that works in practice. Um, so... so in this scenario, what would happen, would happen is Grant would run, run the get latest, it would fail, and probably find out who made the change and give me a phone call and complain and say, look, something's not working, it's your fault, fix it. So I would go in and try to fix the problem. And I would use the migrations tab here, add migration scripts. And this is where I, I insert my, my custom script. So I can give it a name, which is uh, update. Um, what did I update? Updates. 
Published, published date. date. Published date. Nice. Yeah. No, so just t testing whether you're awake. Um, <laughs> published, uh, published date and sets um, um, column to not null. Um, again, I've got a convenient snippet for this. Uh, and what this snippet does is that it first does a check to make sure that um, the, public, the column actually exists. Because it could be that you're running this upgrade process on, a, let's say, a blank database <coughs> even before the, 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 the column was added. And you don't want your uh, deployment to fail as a result. So we, it's what we call the guard clause. So it's just an if exists. Um, and then we, we run the logic. So the logic is exactly the same logic that, we, that you saw before. It's the update setting the published date to an arbitrary value. doesn't really matter. And an alter table articles um, setting it to not null. So I save that, and I would commit that change to my version control system. Incidentally, what's happened here is that um, because we, we made that change and committed it to source control, once we fixed the, uh, the, the test, well, not so, fixed the, um, the function, and we made, uh, the, did the not null change, that obviously was a change detected by my uh, build server, and that failed as well. And then it failed in an interesting way, um, let's view the build log for more information. What it says here is aborting due to high severity warning. The column publish date um, DBO articles is marked as not null. There is no default value, so the update may fail. So the CI process has also detected what Grant found when he did this, his get latest. Because it's trying to keep a database up to date on every change, that's effectively doing a mi mini deployment check every time I make a change. So it was trying to make my up-to-date database more up-to-date, try to make that um, the not null change and fail because I have data in my um, always up-to-date database. Had that not failed, the upgrade test would have failed exactly in the same way. So the, the CI process is a really good fail safe. Um, so even if Grant didn't exist and I was just a lone developer on this project, if I was using um, CI, I would, I would have been notified of this, this problem and I would have been notified immediately so I can fix it so that my deployment um, um, doesn't have problems later on in the project cycle. How much time do I have left? Ten minutes. Ten minutes. Okay, that's perfect. So, so what I'm going to say here is added my creation script to do the updates. And I'm going to commit that, <coughs> go back to Grant, and now when I click Get Latest, it's taking slightly longer than normal. And this is because it's, it's firing up LocalDB, which is a, um, a, a, like a SQL Server Express instance, to create that one prime database that I described earlier. So it's um, applying my migration scripts to um, LocalDB, and the outcome is the one that is compared using SQL Compare, and that's attached on to the migration scripts, and these are run as a deployment script, and you get this. You don't need to know this. It's all magic, but that's how it works under the hood. So that, um, that process worked, and if I actually drill down into Grant's database, and I show you what the data looks like, you'll see that... There are three, um, the first, third, and the fifth one are all 1st of January 2000. So that gives me a, a good indication that these are the ones that were null that have been converted by my process. Is that new functionality, the, the local DB for the migrations? Yes. So, we have, so the reason it's called migrations v2 is that there is a migrations v1. And that is a, is a technology that exists now and you can use in the, in the tool. but. Um, it's implemented differently, so the migration scripts uh, aren't saved in the same place. So the way we, the place we save them now is we save them in a table valued function in the database itself. Um, before we, we saved it in source control exclusively, which means um, that if you try to create a deployment script somewhere where you can't see back to your source control system, then migrations would fail. So that, so that was an architectural limitation that we decided that you know, we couldn't live with and the users shouldn't have to deal with. So we've put them in the database as well. Obviously, it's saved in source control as well because the table value function is a, an object and it's saved in source control. But more importantly, it's in the database. So if you haven't tried this out, 
then um, you can either send me an email. My email address is, uh, is uh, on the last slide. Or uh, contact uh, anyone from Redgate and, and, and ask um, for details. But you can also search for Redgate Migrations V2 in Google, and you'll be able to find a build with this functionality in it. Um, so, so what we have now is uh, hopefully we have a, another build that's kicked off that will run through this entire process again and, and it should not, shouldn't fail because the migrations is being used by the CI process and will have successfully updated uh, my objects. So I think that's pretty much it for the demo side. I've got a couple more slides just to recap what we've seen. Um, so database CI, so what it does is it, keep, it can keep a database up to date. You don't have to do all of these things. You can pick and choose. You can run uh, SQL tests and generate some data. You can generate your documentation. You can uh, generate and validate um, deployment scripts, and these can be upgrade scripts or creation scripts. And you can publish um, to deployment manager uh, these, this, these packages that can be used um, in that tool. Um, SQL test, uh, which we showed, because it's part of the CI process as well. What we showed you is um, how to add a new test, how continuous integration identifies failures. Um, we managed to reproduce that failure locally. Uh, we, we fixed the bug and tested it. In fact, we found an extra bug, so we got a bonus bug in there. And we managed to fix both of those, and we committed those fixes to source control. Um, that fix to source control also uh, highlighted the need for migration scripts because um, it, we had to do the additional updates uh, for, for our not null column. Um, not the get latest obviously notified us of that issue. Ideally, CI would notify us first, we would fix it before Grant gets a chance to do that get latest so he's not impacted by that bug. Um, and we, we, we fixed that so everything's good. And there's a white paper um, on our website. So if you go to redgate.com forward slash CI, there's a white paper that describes how to set up CI, all the tools and technologies you need to get up and running. Uh, it might have my email address in it. If it doesn't, that's my email address. Um, do feel free to let me know uh, if, you have any, if you want any additional information, if you've got any questions, or if you try it out and you get stuck, I'd be happy to um, take you through that process. Um, in fact, you know, we, we can do screen sharing. If you're, if you're local, which most of you will be, then we can even possibly arrange a customer visit and we, we, can, we can try to get, get, get up and running in your environment because it's really useful feedback for us to see you guys in your environment trying to get this stuff uh, working. So uh, I think we've got a few minutes left for questions. We've got five minutes left. Have you got any questions? Okay. You showed us the CI stuff using Team City. Yes. What about if you're using Microsoft Build? Yes. Do you have to integrate yourself so um, we have the SQL automation pack, um, which is um, a wrapper around various resources. Um, and some of, one, of, one such resource is the Team City plugin, but other resources are MS Build scripts. So we have an MS Build script that's it's templated out in a way that you just have to fill in the gaps with your server name, database name, um, true or false, wh whether you want to run tests or not. So it's really simple to get them running with that as well. So you would use the MS Build script most likely if you're using Microsoft. If you're using something like Cruise Control, it's more likely that you're using uh, NANT. But they're very similar technologies. Yes. Any other questions? One? How much control do you have over the order in which um, changes are applied to your, let's say, your live system? Uh, we have several uh, occasions when in order to get from A to B with a new bit of functionality mm. you have to change this table, change the store procedure, then do something else, but do it in the right order so that the existing apps that are still running don't trip over the new stuff before it's um, ready. Migration, script, migration scripts are run in a defined order which you can change. So I, I think that's the way you would do it. You would probably implement migration scripts and make sure that they, they are in the right order themselves. But I thought you showed that the continuous integration process worked out what it needed to do to integrate your changes. Um, yes, it, it, let's, I can quickly go back to that, that slide. So it's this one here. It will run the, your migration scripts 
in the order that you've defined them in, in the tool, and then it does the rest using SQL Compare. So if there's something that SQL Compare is getting wrong in its ordering, then you could, in theory, implement those specific changes in the right order as a migration script. And then, because that change would already have happened by the time SQL Compare compares 1 prime to 12, SQL Compare will just ignore that for all intents and purposes. Uh, no, it's not. So migration, uh, the question was, was, is migrations v2 in production? No, it's, it's in a beta. Um, we have plans to put it as a beta in the actual release so that so you, you can turn on the feature within the tool, but that will be probably Q2 this year. But um, if, if you Google for migrations v2 Redgate, then you, you, can, you can at least try it out. Um, but but the, the build should be quite good, so... Uh, with, with usual disclaimers. Yeah. Any further questions? Can I ask about the SQL test? In, of in course. In terms of setting it up, like, do you actually do you just install SQL test and then do your own test, or do you still need to do something about the SQL to train for this thing? Um, it's very simple if you, if you, well, it's very simple generally. So if I wanted to add SQL test to um, widget dev database, um, I would go to SQL test and add database to SQL test. Um, and I can't remember which one I said, widget dev. And I do add database. And then it will say it will install the framework. So it's warning you that it's going to install some additional objects on the database. And you can say OK. And then it will just it's run a script. But if you download the T-SQL-T framework from the open source website, then there is a SQL script that will do the same, which is we're just running. So we, we wrapped that. Um, in, 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 a, in a UI. So it's very simple. So if you, if you go to tsqlt.org, download, um, click follow the download links, open the zip file, there's one SQL file there, open that in Management Studio, choose your database, F5, done. That's it. Any last questions? Yeah? What if your changes consist of some non SQL stuff? For instance, you need to make a change to an XML config file on the production server. Mm. Obviously, this is all SQL related stuff. Yes. How do you, uh, you know, if, if it's the DBA's role to deploy a new feature, yeah. how do you, instead of writing, I don't know, a, a Word document with an instruction of how, what he needs to okay. do step by step, can you put something in the tool? That, that's, that's, a, that. that's a very convenient segue. So the question is, if it's, if it's not a database change, how do you fit that into your deployment yeah. processes? So um, I'm not going to steal Grant's thunder, but this is the tool you're just about to look at. And you can see here that you've defined all your environments along the top and that you can call them what you want. I've got latest testing, staging, production. Um, and I've got my projects along the left-hand side. And what you can do here is you can use this as a deployment tool. And underneath these, you can, there is a database, but there's also other stuff. That, so that you would do it within this, this mechanism. And, and that's something you can bring up during the next session. So that's a fantastic segue. Okay, I think, I think we're done for time. So thank you very much for listening. And if you have any questions, you can grab me during the break now or after during the beer uh, or just simply send me an email or uh, send an email to someone that you know at Redgate and um, we'll, we'll get in touch and we'll help you solve those issues. Did you mention the thing that we were supposed to um, That thing was the fact that we are really happy to help you um, and we will we'll, We'd be willing to, to visit your offices as long as they're reason, reasonably local and uh, to help you get and running with this stuff because we value the feedback just as so much as uh, hopefully that you'll value the, the, uh, the benefit of, of having us on site as well. Can I just add to that that if you, if you would like us to come in uh, to set up CI and also when Grant goes through Deployment Manager as well, if you'd actually like us to come in on site, do come and grab me. I'll be around at this break and after Grant's session. So is this something you'd like us to come in and actually set up for you when you come and grab me? Okay, thank you very much.